Good to have you here. Good morning. Good morning. Good to be with you. Before we begin, Senator Cruz, Al Franken says hi. <laughs> I'm sure he does. He does. I want to start with Harvey. Serious topic. Uh, you all were just there again. You've been there multiple times since the uh, hurricane hit. Uh, people who are not from Texas don't understand the magnitude of the damage. Even people in Texas don't understand the significant portion of the state that's been affected. And the consequences of it are not going to be short term, they're going to be long term, and they're really incalculable. Any number that's been put on the magnitude of the damage, you're going to have to figure will go up and up and up over time. You wrote an uh, op-ed jointly today, uh, this week, that you published in Texas newspapers that said basically, we have your back on Harvey. Senator Cornell, what, what does it mean that you and, and Senator Cruz, and by extension the federal government, has Texas's back? What does that mean? Well, the response to Harvey uh, was multi-layered in that the president and his cabinet, uh, right. I thought, did an extraordinary job uh, offering their support and uh, resources through the federal government. Um, of course, you couple that with uh, Governor Abbott and the incredible job that uh, his team did, Nim Kidd at the Emergency Operations Center and the whole array of people who work there and prepare right. for terrible disasters like this. But where Ted and I uh, come into the picture is we thought it was very important to assure that uh, Texas got at least a down payment on some of the financial resources we need in order to rebuild. It's just the beginning but we were able to secure 15 and a quarter billion dollars in uh, federal funding as a start toward that effort. In fact, the Senate raised the number, did it not? The House had a number and then right. the Senate raised the number. We, we doubled the House number right. and, and it was uh, passed and uh, signed. And, and one thing I learned from that or was reminded of, yeah. something Kay Bailey Hutchison always uh, reminded us of when she was in the Senate, is when the Texas delegation stands together with our arm's length. There is no right. power in Washington, D.C. that can stop us. And we're determined to make sure that Texas is not treated better right. than other states, but we sure won't tolerate being treated worse. Senator Cruz, I move to observe that the Texas delegation was not together. Four Republicans in the Texas House voted against the aid package. What was that about? I'll let them speak for themselves. I wish they would. <laughs> but, but I will say this, number one, the impact of Harvey has been extraordinary. You know this part of the state extremely well, and you actually had family and friends who were directly impacted Look, by Houston this. Houston is my home. I grew right. up in Houston. Right. Uh, if, if you grow up in Houston, hurricanes are part of life. That's, that's life on the Gulf Coast. Right. Harvey was different. I mean, I, I remember as a kid, Hurricane Alicia, my parents and I sheltering in the bathroom while that was hitting, and we had a tree fall in the front yard. I mean, yeah. that, that's, that's life in Texas on the coast. What Harvey did was very different. It, it, it came in in South Texas uh, as a Category 4 hurricane. Right. And it made landfall just decimating Victoria and Rockport and Port Aransas and Aransas Pass and Refurio, uh, all communities I've been to multiple times in the last few weeks. And, and the winds were, were devastating. You saw homes obliterated, businesses obliterated. Right. In Refurio, I saw a small plane that the wind had plucked it out of, out of a hangar that was destroyed, thrown it a quarter mile, plowed it nose first into the ground, and the tail was resting up against another building. Yep. Then the storm wasn't done. It went north and east, went over the city of Houston, and sat there for four days. Yep. Like, like your in-laws at Christmas. <laughs> my my mother-in-law is here. <laughs> <laughs> Not your in-laws. Not mine. <laughs> just, but just, it just, just wouldn't leave. Right, yeah. Four days. Yeah. We got, and we're trying to keep up with, with Jerry Lewis and Dean Martin. We're do, do, doing, doing our doing best. Yeah, yeah. We don't know well, who's I mean, Jerry and who's Dean. Yeah, well, yeah. But I'm, I'm pretty sure Cornyn is going to get a martini and start singing in a few minutes. Okay. Okay. No, nobody light a cigarette will be good. Um, but, but Senator Cruz, the reality is, yes, the storm hung out over Houston for a long period of time. That magnified the effects of it. And a lot of people are saying, you know, honestly, if it had stayed a little bit longer, the devastation would have even been that much worse. I mean, in some ways, as horrible as it was, we should count our blessings that it wasn't even worse than it was. Right. Well, but I'll tell you, the yeah. scope of the damage, we had 52 inches of rain right. in four days, right. which is about the average annual rainfall in Houston. Then right. it moved east, and it, it just... Yeah pummeled Beaumont and Port Arthur and Orange and Nederland. 
You know, on Friday, John and I were both down in Houston with Correct. Paul Ryan. Speaker Ryan was down, right. And, yeah. and also with the chairman of the House Appropriations Committee. And, and among other things, we took a helicopter tour of the damage. Right. I think it was very good for the speaker and the chairman to see firsthand as we're flying over neighborhood after neighborhood. And John and I were both pointing out to Paul, you see street after street after street where every house, you have all the, all the furniture, all the carpet, all the sheetrock, everything yeah. they own just piled in their front yard. And, and I think it really made an impact on them, the right. geographic scope. They were just like, it keeps going and going. Right. The point I made to them, I said, Paul, if you go 100 miles to the east or 100 miles to the south, it keeps on going. Right. It is 250 miles of devastation. It's been estimated to be more than 20% Right, I mean, the, the, the size of it, that is exactly right. The size of it is extraordinary. So, Senator Cornyn, so, Speaker's been here, Chair of the House Appropriations Committee has been here. The nation's eyes are on Houston. And you have our backs. So I want to ask you about some specific things that might fall under the heading of you have our backs, okay? Uh, three things in particular I want to ask you about. Uh, uh, the first is that uh, there has been a call for a third reservoir in Northwest Houston. I know that uh, Homeland Security Chairman McCall, congressman from this area, stretching to Houston, has been looking into this uh, potential. Mm -hmm. This is what we hear from our friends in Harris County. In Houston, we need a third reservoir. That's a federal deal. That's got a $320 million price tag. I know that the Harris County Flood Control District was already promised reimbursements for infrastructure investments they made uh, uh, previously along the bayous, and they have not received the money that they believe that they were promised and are entitled to. And then, of course, something that you've worked on, Senator Cornyn, the so-called coastal spine that would protect the Houston region from storm surges. Houston was very fortunate not to have a storm surge. Yeah. Rockport got creamed, but, unfortunately, but you know, fortunately for Houston, it did not. That's $10 billion, could conceivably be more. You guys going to come across with that money? You have our backs. Do we have our money? Well, we need a plan first, Evan, and I think what this demonstrates is the importance of the near-term, mid-term, and long-term okay. uh, efforts. Obviously, the near-term effort is, as we've been discussing, helping people uh, get back in their houses and restore some semblance of normalcy to their lives. But there are also a number of flood control projects that have been approved as far back as, I think, 1940 by the Corps of Engineers yep. that would have mitigated a lot of the flooding in the Houston area that were simply not built because of lack of resources. And that's something that I want to make sure. Who, 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 does that, who is that on, that's the Senator? Who owns that, the, that, that miss? The Corps of Engineers. But who do they work for? Well, they work for the Army. And then they work for all of us, I pres presume. I just want to know why they didn't do what might have made a difference in advance of this storm. I think what happens is after the storm goes away, that uh, people's memories dim and other priorities come to the forefront. So we can't, we're going to try to prevent that from happening here right. by getting funding for some of those mid-term mid efforts, particularly those that are shovel-ready. And these really are shovel-ready. Shovel-ready, right. Yeah. Um, and then the long-term one you mentioned, which uh, Ted and I have both been working on, is the so-called coastal spine or the Ike Dike, because you're right, if a hurricane came up uh, in the middle of the Houston ship channel, it would be even more devastating. It'd be lights out for the economy and for so many people, and you know, the rebuild would be even longer and more difficult. We dropped yeah. up one or more points of national GDP because of the impact right. economically, not to mention the local devastation. Right. So what we're, what we're getting in May of 2018, and unfortunately these plans, because of their size and scope and expense, take time, Corps of Engineers is supposed to issue a preliminary plan. Right. And uh, what we're tr going to do in some of, this, uh, some of these bills that are going to pass in October and December is get, do everything we can to expedite the approval process of a plan that's agreed upon by local and state stakeholders and then, then our job is going to be to try to get the funding for that. Um, but we can't get the funding until we have a plan, so that's why we've been just pushing the Corps. That's why we, in the last Water Resources Development Bill, we said instead of the Corps having to do their own uh, environmental impact study, let's yep. use ones that have already been done so you don't have to duplicate that effort along with the delay because it is a, a very uh, profound concern of yep. mine that uh, this is a wake-up call, and uh, it could be worse, as, uh, as you've noted. Se Senator Cruz, the expense of this, again, not 
known yet, but it will be considerable, and sure. it's going to strain the federal budget just as the expense to Texas, whatever percentage of the overall bill we have to pay is going to strain the Texas budget. Over this weekend, we've had a number of conversations about Harvey and about the expense and about the need to rebuild, and what we have heard consistently from people or I've heard is, yeah, forget about building that wall. We're not going to have the money to build that wall. We're not going to have the money available. We need to put the money into things like this. What do you think about that? I think the people who are saying that are people whose political agenda, they didn't want to build a wall to begin with, and so they're happy to hook it to any other political issue they can. Yeah, but they can also do math, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you are a senator. You're talking about a lot of money, right? So, so Evan, I just, just want to be clear. Your position is... Democratic members of the United States Congress can do math. No, my, my, my difference is that you can also do math. I'm also <laughs> saying a Republican member of the Senate can do math. I mean, I'm... I'm all, all right, let me yeah. give you some math on yeah. a wall, actually. Yeah. That, Please. Uh, estimated cost of building a wall is between 14 and $20 billion. Right. I introduced legislation earlier this year called the El Chapo Act. Because it so happens, El Chapo, the Mexican drug lord, is in federal custody. He's being prosecuted. The Department right. of Justice has stated its intention to bring federal criminal a asset forfeiture against him and the estimated value of his global empire is $14 billion. My legislation said, fine, take El Chapo's money that he got crossing our borders, trafficking human beings and right. drugs, and use that for border security. And so Mexico will pay for the wall after all? Uh, no, El but El Chapo might. Yeah, well. Uh, and, and, and other drug lords might. Listen, yeah. The objection to the wall is not the money. This is the only instance in the history of the universe in which Democrats have said something costs too much. The objection is they, they don't support building a wall or border security. That's their position. So let me ask you, Senator, let me ask it this way. If the choice is either or, do you put the wall ahead of being able to fund some of these projects in Houston, or do you say it's not really a real choice, it's both ends? It is both. And, and, and let, me, let me say, let me go back to Harvey for a minute. Yeah. In, in any disaster, there are phases. The first phase when the crisis was active was saving lives. Yes. And we saw incredible heroism on the part of first responders and guardsmen and, and ordinary citizens. Yeah. Men and women saving their neighbors, as I've called them, rednecks and bass boats. It, it was the very best of Texas, I right. believe. And, poli and politics aside, like people put it, politics oh, aside. Everyone, right. there, there, there was no politics after right. that you begin the rebuilding. And what John said is very important. The Texas delegation is united. The House passed an initial bill, $7.5 billion. It went to the Senate. John and I teamed together, and we doubled that right. from $7.5 billion to over $15 billion, was passed into law, signed by the President. Right. That's intended to be a down payment. Nobody thinks that's anywhere close to what's going to be required to rebuild. But it, it got emergency funds on the ground available for relief right now. Right. To give you a sense of just how, how united the delegation is right now, the week after the storm, uh, I was asked to address the Houston City Council. Uh, and, and I did so along with Sheila Jackson Lee. Right. Now, you know, Sheila and I agree on just about everything. Both of us said to the city council, we, we, were, we were there primarily saying thank you. Yep. Thank you to the police officers, the firefighters, the city workers, the county workers, the people who had yep. just been truly heroes. One of the council members pointed out that at that hearing, it so happened that Sheila was wearing red and I was wearing blue. Now, that was not intentional, but it, it, uh, it, Symbolism. it, it made a nice point, at which point right. Sheila and I hugged each other. Uh, which I joke later may have ended both, both her political career and, and, and mine. certainly yours. That's right. Yeah, uh, but, so, but yeah. that unity is important. <laughs> yeah, and so going forward, right now all of the local jurisdictions, the mayors, the county judges, are quantifying the damage. That's the way the federal law works. Is you've got to assess. All right, how many houses right, were right. damaged? How many businesses? How many courthouses? Once those are quantified, John and I are going to take the lead in the Texas delegation ensuring that Texans receive what they're federally entitled to under federal law. Red and blue members of oh, the delegation, right. Speaking with one voice. Got it. But part of the purpose of the tour on Friday with the speaker and appropriations chairman, yep. we were going up Buffalo Bayou. We went up to the Attucks Reservoir and the Barker Reservoir. We went down the Bray's Bayou, we went by the Sims Bayou yep. to show them Okay, this is the existing system of bayous. This is the flood control provisions that are in there. Harris County Flood Control was in the chopper with us. 
talking about if we're going to spend money rebuilding, let's rebuild in a smart way. Let's not just pour money down the drain. Let's rebuild in a way that the flood control prevention right. is incorporated into it so that we don't have this Good. problem again. And I think there was strong agreement from leadership that that's what made that's sense. What happened. Evan, one, so, yeah. thing, one thing that we've just established, Ted Cruz is a hugger. He is. He's a big <laughs> He's hugger. A hugger. That's exactly right. Well, I'm going to be asking in about 40 minutes for the two of you to hug. So we'll see if that actually happens. Um, <laughs> Um, I'm, Senator I'm Cornyn. Cuban. Yeah. Senator Cornyn, uh, are you and Senator Cruz prepared after this hurricane to have a different conversation about climate change? <laughs> I'm not sure I know what you mean by a different conversation, but I'm certainly open to um, what the science proves and what we can learn about the problem. Do you believe and, this event gives you any reason to think differently about the issue? Let me say I, it that I way. don't know. I don't know. Here's my, my position on climate, is I do believe humans impact the climate. I mean, that seems right. so obvious to me. The question is, <laughs> the question is, what do we do about it? Do we build up government and institutions in a way that actually suppresses or depresses economic activity and job creation and empowers government over the individual? Or do we do what we have always done, which is rely on our inventors, our innovators and entrepreneurs to come up with uh, solutions? For example, this, to the solution of horse-drawn carriages in the 19th century um, and the, the horse manure that piled up in New York City and was a public health hazard, it went away almost overnight with the development of the internal combustion engine. Right. Paul Ehrlich wrote a book called The Population Bomb back when I was growing up that predicted that millions of people would starve to death because food production couldn't keep up with the uh, demand. And uh, then Norman Borlaug and the Green Revolution came along, which have saved millions of lives because of that, develop that scientific innovation development. So I trust our ability given the proper research, yep. and uh, to come up with solutions that will help us solve the problem. We've done a lot just with the advent of uh, natural, using more natural gas, and our renewables in Texas, we're the number one electricity producer from, uh, right. from wind. I think we can figure this thing out. Senator Cruz, let me ask you a different question, but in a similar way. Are you prepared to have a different conversation about DACA and immigration, given the fact that the rebuild will largely be on the backs, almost certainly, of undocumented labor? Let me start with your first question on climate change. Okay. But, but I remember my second question. I'm happy to get to your Just, second question. We'll, we'll but, get to but, the doctor. There's, no, there's, noted. There's a reason I said, let me start. Oh, got it. Okay, <laughs> good. Just a second. You know, it's, it's interesting when, whenever there's any natural disaster, uh, you hear folks in the media talking about, and some politicians, gosh, therefore this proves global warming. Uh, I would note we've had hurricanes since the dawn of time. We will continue to have hurricanes. Will they be back to back to back? Like well, they it's have interesting. Been? So, so if evidence of climate change is hurricanes occurring more frequently, then there's a problem. We've had a 14-year hiatus of hurricanes making landfall in the United States. So, so actually, historically right now, we're in a low period for hurricanes. We just had a couple of really bad ones back to back. But if you're actually looking at the evidence of hurricanes, you, you have to go back a long time to find the last okay. major hurricane to make a so landfall. So, yeah. so your, your view is this does not change that conversation? Then. And more broadly, that yeah. we should follow science and data. I, I am the son of two mathematicians and computer programmers. I believe in science. I'm the chairman of the Science and Space Subcommittee of the Senate Commerce Committee. Now, I recognize for a lot of folks in college that climate change is taught from one perspective and one perspective only. <laughs> and so, and that the response in college that's encouraged is when facts or data to the contrary are presented to hiss or yell them down rather than to actually consider them. That's not the purpose of education. The purpose of education is to learn to think and think critically. So for example, um, if folks actually want to study the data, 
I would encourage you to take a look at the satellite data. We have satellites circling the Earth that measure the temperature. The computer models for global warming predicted that temperature would keep warming and warming and warming and warming. There then became a problem. The satellites measuring the actual temperature found that there wasn't any warming, that for 18 years, the warming had stopped. It's actually, in, in, in the climate debate, it's called the pause. They had no explanation because their computer model said it's supposed to be up here. The satellite data found that it wasn't happening. The response, I would actually encourage someone, if you want to watch an exchange where the head of the Sierra Club was testifying before a Senate committee, and I asked him about this, you can Google and find that exchange. And I can tell you, instead of actually engaging on the facts and data, the response of many of the alarmists is simply to engage in political attacks. Look, it's the language of religion. You, you hear climate deniers. Denier is, is a heretic. It's the language of religion. You must accept this dogma, facts be damned. I think the facts matter. We ought to follow the actual facts and evidence, and there are too many politicians who support massive government control of the economy and every aspect of your life, who you notice in the whole climate debate. 30 years ago, it was global cooling. I'm old enough to remember when those on the left were saying, we're headed to another ice age, global cooling, and the answer is give government control of every aspect of your life. Then, it magically became global warming. Same scientists, same politicians, the earth is warming, and the solution was, again, give us power over your life. And then you remember a couple of years ago, the term magically changed. Have any of you noticed that, that, that the alarmists don't use the words global warming anymore? They use climate change. And the beauty of it is, climate change is the perfect pseudo-scientific label. Why? Because, how many of you remember junior high, the scientific process, that you have a hypothesis, you test it with evidence? Climate change can never be disproven. The climate is right. always changing. And this theory says, whether it gets hotter or colder, wetter or drier, whatever happens, therefore my theory is right. Any and all change proves me right. And so therefore, government should have control of every aspect of your life. That's not science. S S Senator, Senator, we're now... I would say that was a category five answer. <laughs> and I want to come back to DACA, because I promised I would. Do you have sure. a point of, do you have a point of view? Do you have any different point of view about DACA or immigration, looking at it through the Harvey lens, considering that what is said by people on the ground there is that a lot of undocumented labor will be involved with the rebuild of this part of the state? Look, immigration is an issue where I, I think outside of Washington, there's a lot of agreement. There's a lot of agreement in Texas. There's a lot of agreement across the country. My views on immigration, I've said many times, can be summed up by four words. Legal, good. Illegal, bad. I think that's where the overwhelming majority of Americans are. And again, in this, ca in this case, that does not change. Nothing changes as far as, as far as that goes. Nothing changes that I believe we should secure the border, that we yeah. need to have the border safe, that it doesn't make sense to have a system where children are trafficked in or abused by coyotes and drug cartels or physically and sexually assaulted. That's not a humane system. That is a horrible system. And you can believe in rule of law, you can believe in securing the border, right. and you can also believe, as I do, that legal immigrants, Ronald Reagan referred to legal immigrants as Americans by choice. My dad came from Cuba in 1957 to come to Austin, to come to the University of Texas, right. with nothing, with $100 in his underwear, and he yeah. washed dishes making 50 cents an hour. We are a nation of immigrants, and we can welcome and celebrate immigrants coming for the American dream while at the same time believing in and enforcing let, the Let me get policy. Senator Cornyn in on this. I'm going to ask you the same question about DACA. To, to Senator Cruz's phrase, these kids who've been here, you know, are probably to that for a phrasing, America's by, Americans by not their choice, right? Their parents brought them here. Right. So you, you understand that the discussion about DACA, separate and apart from the hurricane, has been, what do you do about these kids? That's always yeah. how this is phrased. Does your perspective on this issue, DACA or immigration, in any way change against the backdrop of this occurrence? I don't really think it changes as a result of Harvey, but let me tell you what my views are, sure. Evan. Um, I've been in the immigration wars in the Congress now my entire time I've yes, been sir. there. We've tried to deal with this problem, 
and reconcile these two competing interests. We are a nation of immigrants, and we are the beneficiary of that, the best and the brightest, the risk takers, people coming to our country, creating economic activity, yes. helping to keep the American dream alive. But we are also a nation of laws. And somehow we've lost sight of that part of it, and I think it needs to be restored. One of the things that I think President Trump helped get him elected, he may not have articulated it quite like I would, but restoring security to the border and enforcing the rule of law, it, to me, is a prerequisite of dealing with other immigration issues because we are the most generous country in the world when it comes to legal so immigration. That does, so that does not so here's, right. the, here's, here's yeah. the deal. I think President Obama, I, I believe, inappropriately tried to do this on his own because he became frustrated with the slow pace of Congress. So the courts had kicked it back, and the president now has kicked it back to us, where I think it appropriately resides. And we, I think it's an opportunity for are, us are to you address deal, Will you deal with it? I'm, I welcome right. the chance to deal with it. But it's going to, right. I think we're going to have to deal with both, both parts of this. Both our uh, legacy as a nation of immigrants and a nation that believes in the rule of law, border security, enforcement. I think there's a, uh, there's, there's right. a deal to be had. Senator Cruz, while we're on demography, I want to ask you about race. Is Colin Kaepernick a son of a bitch? <laughs> an interesting question, Evan. <laughs> That's why I asked it. <laughs> Listen, I believe in free speech. I've spent most of my adult life fighting to defend the Constitution and Bill of Rights. Yep. I believe in free speech for people I agree with and people I disagree with. Colin Kaepernick has every right to say what he wants to. He has every right, if he wants to disrespect the flag, he can. And the rest of us have a right to express our views. Including expressing a view that it's disrespecting the flag as opposed to how somebody else might characterize it. You, you know, yes. I mean, right, I'm, I'm, a couple of weeks ago, I was at the first Texans game after the flood. Yeah. Before the game, First responders carried out a gigantic American flag the size of the football field, and it was held by police officers and firefighters covering the entire field. Yep. I was down on the sideline with them. That was a powerful, it was an amazing moment for the city of Houston standing together as a country. Yep. Listen, I for one am not a fan of rich, spoiled athletes disrespecting the flag. But the reality is, but the reality is, and, and I will say yeah. that, that those in college that find that interesting. I think there may be some older people booing also. Stop, you, you, stop, you know, stop, stop. You know what, there, there were also. Yeah, I don't think it's only college people who are booing, but keep going. There are also. <laughs> I, I work the line. Uh, <laughs> Evan, yeah. I don't doubt that the People's Republic of Travis County there are those. Your, there, your, there your are, constituents, you mean? Your, your constituents. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Right. There are those who think it is acceptable and a good thing to burn a flag. That has been an, but that's an not, activity but, 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 but of protest. But that's not the, that's not the issue yeah, here. But, 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 but hold on a second. Yeah. It, it is the issue. <clears throat> How's that? Of It is a way of expressing speech. And let me be clear. Right. Folks have a right to burn a flag, to kneel dur right. during the Star Spangled Banner, do whatever they want to express right. political speech. Yeah. But everyone else has a right. In my view, I think that is disrespectful to the soldiers and sailors and airmen and marines that are fighting to protect our rights. And we have every bit of right to say, I disagree with your speech. Right. That's how free speech works, is that you have a Absolutely. right to, to confront it and, right. and, and, and to say that directly. That's not silencing anyone. Free no. speech means... Well, you said at the very beginning that you believe he has a right to, to do what he said as a, as a part of his expression but, of free speech. But, but you know what? Millions of people also have a right, if they want, to, to, turn, to, push off, back. to turn off the NFL or not to buy right. T-shirts or to express their right. views. So let me get to if, that. If, so yeah. so let, me, let me get to that. So 534 this morning, it will come as no surprise to you. I was up this morning on Twitter. <laughs> no surprise at all. This is President Trump this morning 
<laughs> no, it was actually at 544. He gave us a break for 10 minutes. I'm that sorry. That was Eastern time. Oh, it was Eastern time, right. Yeah, okay. If, uh, this is Donald Trump this morning. If NFL fans refuse to go to games until players stop disrespecting our flag and country, you'll see change take place fast, fire or suspend. That was not the only tweet on this subject before or after. The president is suggesting, he's pushing back against not just the players but the NFL, and he is essentially calling out the owners of teams to fire these guys who are, and I gather from the news reports, we're going to see a whole bunch of people responding to the president today with an expression of their free speech during NFL games. Uh, the president's calling for players to be fired and for team owners to fire them. What do, you, what do you think about that? And what do you think about Kaepernick? Well, a few months ago when uh, Admiral Bill McRaven weighed in on this in his capacity as chancellor of the university, and I thought wrote one of the most thoughtful mm -hmm. responses to this, and he acknowledged that in his 37 years of military service, he fought for and defended the rights of people to express themselves right. along the lines that Ted was just talking about. Um, but he, at the same time, encouraged his, uh, the football teams, the University of Texas in the UT system, for people to stand respectfully during the national anthem. And uh, I agree with him uh, 100%. I think, I think it is un profoundly ungrateful, given the sacrifice that our military um, personnel have made and their families, and some of whom have made the ultimate sacrifice not to demonstrate respect for the flag. Even if that's not what the protest in the minds of those protesting well, they, is about. Well, I think they need to reassess what the message is because that's the message, the message. that okay. many have received is yeah. one of profound Let ungratefulness and disrespect. And so I believe that both sides have the, op have the right to express themselves. I, for one, um, believe that, um, that uh, people may choose not to patronize. Uh, some of these teams by but that, their... But that's, but that's their but choice. That, and that's their choice. An expression of, in a, in a way, of their own speech. Sure. That's right. right. Is to that's choose right. it. Let me that's, yeah. that's okay. Let me ask about the Affordable Care Act and where we stand with Graham Cassidy. Um, it is today, September 24th. There are six days until September 30th. If I understand the way this works, you guys got to get this done by September 30th or it gets a lot harder. Senator McCain came out against. Senator Paul is against. Some people who heard that Senator McCain was against said, everything's great, it's done, but in fact, we don't have a third no vote on Graham Cassidy. Will you be the third no vote on Graham Cassidy, Senator Cornyn? <laughs> Just the opposite. I believe this... That, that was, I, I actually knew the answer to that I question believe, before I asked it. Texas... Texas and Texans will benefit in a dramatic sort of way by the block grants coming to the states because we weren't a Medicaid expansion state. State's going to get a bunch of money. Absolutely. And yeah. it provides an enormous opportunity for the laboratories of democracy, right. the states to come up with different ways to provide access to health care for their own people. Because we weren't a Medicaid expansion state, actually between, people between 100% and 138% of poverty were left out of the Affordable Care Act. And so what this will do is provide funds that will allow premium support, allow people to get private insurance instead of Medicaid. Pre-existing conditions gonna be covered? Can oh, you absolutely. Can you guarantee that? Absolutely. Yeah. You saw the estimates this week, probably I saw the estimates that Texas would see 2.759 million lose coverage under Graham Cassidy? I, I think that's, here's a, an important distinction. The Affordable Care Act, basically says you pay uh, for a health care policy government dictates you must have, or if you don't, you pay a penalty. Yes. And right now we have, I think it's roughly about a half a million Texans who make less than $25,000 a year who can't afford the policy because of the mandates, but they have to pay the penalty. To me, that's profoundly unfair. We ought to provide a policy that people can want and they can afford for their own individual circumstances, and that's something the Affordable right. Care Act does not And do. I knew you were for this. I'm not clear, though, Senator Cruz, on where you've been on this. You know, um, Senator Paul, Rand Paul of Kentucky, <laughs> referred to Graham Cassidy as Obamacare light. He doesn't think it goes far enough. Your former chief of staff, Chip Roy, who has landed back in Texas at the Texas Public Policy Foundation, has a couple times at events we've put on argued against some of the repeal and replace plans in the Congress, not because they're too draconian, but because they don't go far enough. They're not conservative enough. Are you prepared to tell us today where your vote is on Graham Cassidy? Well, it depends what's in it. 
and it has isn't been... The pro isn't the problem that we don't know entirely? Only if you're focusing on actual legislation, and that's the legislative process. As, as, as well, there are six days left. Actually, they're not. The September 30th is, is a bogus deadline. It so, is? Can, so you pass, can you pass it with 60? No, because Democrats are voting no on everything. Democrats... You're going to blame... Oh. Whoa, 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 whoa. The, re the reason that Graham Cassidy is not going to pass is because of Democrats? No, no. Well, they'll all vote no, but you asked if we're going to get 60. We can't, right. we can't get 60 for what time So how is September is. 30th a phony deadline? Uh, because we can do budget resolu resolutions and budget reconciliation at any point. We can do it after September 30th. Budget reconciliation is simply a vehicle that cannot be filibustered. And by right. the way, the reason we're using this vehicle is because the Democratic Party has taken the position that they, the base of the Democratic Party is demanding resist, oppose, filibuster everything. That means that the Democrats are not willing to be part of a solution. And, and, and here's where facts matter. Obamacare is collapsing. People are hurting badly across, hold on a second, Evan, I mean, let's, let's actually talk about what Obamacare is doing. Okay. People are hurting badly across the state of Texas. So I travel the state, I do small business roundtables all over the state where I'll sit down with 20 or 30 small business owners around a table right. and just open it up. I'll say, all right, tell me what worries you, what concerns you, what challenges do you have, what, what are you facing? Every single small business roundtable I've done in the state of Texas in the last five years, yep. at least half of the small business owners around the table list Obamacare as the single biggest obstacle they face. There are two, there are two groups, the 49ers and the 29ers. What are they? The 49ers are the millions of small businesses that have 47, 48, 49 employees but they don't go over 50. Why don't they go over 50? Because Obamacare kicks in on 50 employees. What that means is you've got millions and millions of jobs. Jobs, by the way, for low-income people. Jobs for people like my dad when he was washing dishes. Those are the people who are not getting hired yeah. because what the business owners tell me over and over again, if I go over 50 and I'm subject to Obamacare, I'll go bankrupt. A second group are the 29ers. And those are millions upon millions of people who are forced into part-time work, are forced to work 27, 28, 29 hours a week. Why? Because Obamacare defines a full-time employee as 30 hours a week. And so you end up having a single mom, instead of having one job, having to work two jobs, part-time each, neither one has health care. And you know, John talked about in Texas, each year there are about one million people that the IRS fines under Obamacare. Fines why? Because they don't have the money to afford health insurance. So, so let's look at this for a second. You don't have the money to buy health insurance because premiums have skyrocketed. And on top of that, you get fined by the IRS 50% of that 1 million, make $25,000 a year or less, 80% make 50,000 a year or less. So you've got people who are vulnerable, who are struggling, okay. who can't afford health insurance and the IRS is fining them. Let me quote Bill Clinton on Obamacare. It's the craziest thing you've ever seen. So why are you not for Graham Cassidy then? It depends what's in it. Right, so I yeah. said, oh, so, so hold yeah. on, let, yeah. let me, Graham Cassidy has some very good elements in it. Yeah. The best element in it is taking the federal money, block granting it to right. the states and letting the states implement it and innovate yep. creatively. Okay. It's an away game. Don't worry about it. It's fine. <laughs> people, people win away games. It's okay. Go ahead. My central concern in this yeah. debate, and, and, and this year, right. practically every waking moment, I've been spending trying to bring Republicans together, trying to get to 50 right. votes to get this done. My central concern has been premiums. The biggest reason so many millions of people are unhappy with Obamacare is it's made premiums skyrocket. The average family's premiums have risen over $5,000 a year under Obamacare. I hear all the time from Texans all over the state, people come up to me and say, I can't afford health insurance anymore. 
The federal government created that problem. We got to fix it. Does this bill deal? Does this bill deal with it? Not enough, and that's my concern. So I sat down. Mike Lee and I both sat down with right. Lindsey Graham and Bill Cassidy last week. We laid out a series of changes we wanted to see in the right. bill that are all about giving consumers more freedom, lifting the regulations from the federal government that are driving up premiums, so that premiums can go down and more people can afford health insurance. Had they responded? So last week they took our edits, and we said, if you take these edits, we're a yes. They took our edits, and then a day later they removed our edits. So you're not necessarily a yes. So, so look, right now yeah. they don't have my vote, and I don't think they have Mike Lee's either. Now, right. I want to be a yes. I want to get there because I think but Obamacare yeah. is a disaster. But there's work to be done. But the price to getting there, right. I believe, is focusing on consumer freedom. If you want prices to go down, Econ 101, if you want prices to go down, you want more choices, more options, more competition, and prices right. fall. What does Obamacare do? Fewer choices, less options, less competition, prices rise. S Senator, and if you want people yeah. to have access to health insurance, you want prices to fall. You said, I'm not necessarily going to tell you how I vote on this because I don't know what's in the legislation yet. Do you feel like, let me go back to the question I asked, do you feel like we out in the public who are impacted by this, all of us Americans, do we know what's in the legislation? It, it's a moving target. It's well, but, still but, but you understand, no, but it's a sixth of the economy. I think it's reasonable less. Here's what I'm going to, I want to read you something. This is a tweet. This is a tweet. <laughs> it's not from the president. The people have a right to know what's happening behind closed doors with secret health care negotiations. Do you agree with that? It, de it depends on the context. Okay, the con... <laughs> here's, here's the context. The context is the author of that tweet was John Cornyn in 2010. Okay, I still agree with it. And I, that's, and that's, that's really, and I, that's really... I still Senator, agree with it. Yeah, I know you do. That, that's really my question. Okay, that's but, that's but, my hold question. On, hold on, then yes. let me answer that question. Okay, sure. <laughs> it's why I said it depends on the content. Yeah, yeah. I knew very well you were referring to the original how Obamacare was drafted. Now, I will note, when Obamacare was drafted, Nancy Pelosi famously said, we'll have to pass it to find out what's in it. Right, and, but you guys, and, hate, you guys hated that, and yet you appear to have become the thing you despised. I'm just it, trying to understand. It, except... I mean, I'll, I'll, but, stip but, I'll but, stipulate but, that but, you didn't but, but like Evan, that then. I, Evan, I understand Evan, that. Evan, that's yeah. a great talking point. It just yeah. doesn't have to be true. All right, explain. Okay, if you believe in public debate, name me one issue that has been more vigorously debated in our democratic system the last seven years than Obamacare. We've had four elections on Obamacare. Stop, stop, look, stop, look, stop, look, stop, look, please. Look, let him answer. Uh, let listen, him answer. Listen, I recognize... Stop, let him answer, please. I recognize that there's some folks here who like Obamacare. You know what? There was no ambiguity when I ran for Senate. There was no ambiguity when John Cornyn ran for Senate that we were running. If you elect us, we're going to repeal Obamacare because people are hurting. We had four elections where the voters had that choice, where we had as robust a public debate yes. as we've ever had on substance. You know, you want to look at substance? A couple of months ago, I did a one-on-one -on -one debate with Bernie Sanders on Obamacare. It was yes. on CNN. It was two hours. If you're interested in the topic, Google it and watch right. it. It was more substance than we had the whole presidential election. I guess, Senator Cruz, what I'm asking is, and you understand, and I'll, maybe I'll, but, the but, Senator, but, Senator but, Cruz, but I want to do, do, you feel like, do you feel like this issue, there is any legitimate criticism of members of the Senate who complained about the process, perhaps legitimately, under which Obamacare was passed, but are now doing a version of the same thing? I'm just asking. Well, we've tried to engage our Democratic colleagues they recognize this, particularly in the individual and small group market, that right. premiums have gone up 105% since 2013 alone. And as Ted described, uh, many of the deductibles are simply unaffordable. And so people are being penalized for buying this uh, government mandated health insurance because they can't afford it. So something's clearly wrong here, Evan. And I would think in a normal world that people of different would, approaches and perspectives would come, would come, to come, together, come together, together and try right. to come up with a solution, but that does not seem to be happening is, is in this bipartisanship, and I mean, that's a good way to ask about bipartisanship. You know, a lot of attention, Senator Cruz, to Chuck and Nancy, <laughs> right? It's been the Chuck and Nancy show for the last week with the president on the debt ceiling and potentially on DACA. We actually don't know where that's headed, and the president has apparently concluded, I know from news reports, and what you probably know is a little bit more specific to this than I do, 
that the president believes he can't get a good deal out of the Senate or the House. He's frustrated with Leader McConnell. He's frustrated with Speaker Ryan, and he's decided, I'm gonna go make the best deal I can. You predicted this, didn't you, Senator Cruz? You said back during the campaign, specifically, this is January 21st, 2016, if as a voter, you, this is during the presidential campaign against Donald Trump, Senator Cruz, tweet, if, if you said, if as a voter you think what we need is more Republicans in Washington to cut a deal with Harry Reid and Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer, then I guess Donald Trump's your guy. You were spot on, weren't you? <laughs> you were spot on. I'll let history judge that assessment. Well, but are you comfortable with this kind of bipartisanship? Do you think that's a good thing for the country and for the Senate? Uh, look, we'll see where things go. I, I can tell you Washington right now, the divisiveness, the nastiness, is worse than I've ever seen it. And, you know, back, I think, in February, one of the more liberal Democrats told me, said, Ted, you got to understand, we are terrified of being primary from the left. He said, we're not really worried about the general election. Yeah. I think the Senate Democrats feel confident about the general election. But the, the far left of the Democratic Party is demanding resist, resist, resist. And so we're seeing we had to invoke cloture, which is formally how you stop a right. filibuster, to confirm the ambassador to China. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're filibustering virtually every nomination and virtually every piece of legislation. But there was a version of this in the previous administration, Senator Cornyn, wasn't there? I think it's... <laughs> what wasn't it? I don't think the size and scale compares at all. <laughs> it's true. It's true. And Ted's, <laughs> Ted's exactly right. It's a routine, it's a routine matter now to, uh, right. to to drag out these nominations, to deny the president the team that he needs in order for his administration to function, and it's hurting the country and not serving anybody's interest. But look, I'm not worried about the president talking to Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi. He has every right to do so. This president, never having held public office before and not being experienced yep. in the legislative process, is clearly frustrated. Believe it. Believe you me. He's we, legitimately frustrated. We are frustrated sure. on a daily basis, but we understand that's part of the process. So, and he can't. And the reality is, whatever deal he cuts with Pelosi and Schumer, he can't get anything through Congress unless you guys get on board. Exactly. Right? That's it. Exactly. Well, so it's not a threat to me and or to us or to the country to say he's talking to Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer. Yeah. Chuck Schumer, to, to Ted's point, Chuck Schumer was a guy that I worked with time and time and time again during the previous administration. You're saying do, nice things about Chuck Schumer. I'm saying Chuck Schumer is a, is a uh, pragmatic guy, but now he's been, unfortunately been held hostage by the uh, Warren uh, Sanders part of his party, and he's afraid to make a deal because he doesn't want to expose his members to primaries where he's cut right. deals with Republicans in order to pass legislation because he knows that will expose now, him to primaries. Uh, uh, quick, if you would, let, because let, I want to, in the interest of time, I want to jump on to something else, but go ahead, yeah, please. Let, let yes, me sir. give you a ray of light, though, Yes. that, that even where there is deep partisan division, yeah. it is still possible for people to work together and do something productive in a bipartisan manner. So, as I mentioned, I chair the Science and Space Subcommittee. Yes. The last two years, we've passed two major pieces of space legislation, both of which I authored. Did so in 2015, the Commercial Space uh, Launch Competitiveness Act, and in 2017, the NASA reauthorization, which was the first authorization for NASA in seven years. Yeah. Both of those were able to pass. I did them hand in hand with Bill Nelson, a Democrat from Florida. Yes. And we earned the support of Republicans and Democrats. The first bill was signed by President Obama. The second bill was signed by President Trump. And I think that is good for the country. It's good for Texas. Space matters to Texas. A lot of jobs in Texas turn on space. And I think it is, even in the midst of all this partisan division, it is encouraging that you can see Democrats and Republicans right coming together and agreeing on two major pieces of legislation that impact our state right. and then impact jobs and the economy it's, in our state. It's possible. Yes. And speaking of impacting of our state, I want to ask you a question, a specific question about Russia and about election security. Mm -hmm. um, on Friday, the Department of Homeland Security, according to news reports, notified the election officials in 21 states, including Texas, that the Russians had targeted our election systems. This is Donald Trump's own Department of Homeland Security. This is not 
an outside group so that someone could say, well, we don't know who did it. This is his own DHS specifically citing the Russians. What are we doing to ensure that no one, Russian or uh, of any other provenance, hacks into our elections in 2018 or 2020? What are we doing about that, Senator Cornyn? Well, we are, uh, it's a serious matter. Yeah. It's a serious matter. I uh, am on the Senate Intelligence Committee, and we've been conducting a very thorough investigation of Russians, ac Russia's active measures, which is essentially a, it's a combination of uh, cyber espionage, uh, propaganda, uh, use of social media to, uh, through paid, uh, paid activists who sort of elevate this propaganda so that the mainstream media uh, sees it and embraces it as, as true. Uh, it's a very serious matter. Fortunately, um, what you just recounted, that, that's not new news to me and those of us who've been part of this investigation. And I visited with the Secretary of State here in uh, Rolando Pablos, Pablos yep. and his team about that. It is true they were, they were, there were efforts. Targeted. Uh, you're, targeted, targeted. Targeted. Targeted right. at, at Texas's voter registration system. And, um, but fortunately, uh, they were, uh, they did not, uh, they did not penetrate. Is there the more system. we should be doing, Senator Cruz? But of course there is. Yeah. Uh, listen, th this is a serious problem. Russia has worked to undermine our elections. That didn't start in 2016. Right. They right. have done so for decades. Right. Putin is a bad man. He's a KGB thug. And <laughs> now I'll note it, it, it's, it's even in, in the People's Republic of Travis County, they clap. <laughs> <laughs> right? What's, what's interesting is yeah. that's an applause line here now. But in, in 2012, when Barack Obama was talking with Medvedev and, and he said, tell Vladimir, I will have more flexibility after the election, then suddenly Democrats were not concerned about Putin. So what do we do about the Russians in elections? What do we do? Look, we need to do everything we can to secure our election. Now, I will note, you used a word hacked, and I think it's important to speak with precision here. Okay. Because I, hacked is not accurate for what happened in 2016. We have no evidence that there was a hacking that altered election results. That that would be a very serious well, threat. Well, you can, we hack, need to, but we you can to, hack into something and not alter the results. I mean, uh, can't you? There's, it's important for people to understand what's alleged and what isn't alleged. Right. Nobody is alleging that Russians or anywhere no, else just, broke into the computer and changed the total. All Here's I said, what they tar, are tar, targeted. Okay, targeted. I'm just saying for clarity, it's important yeah. to know what the allegations are or what John Cornyn just said that they engage in propaganda efforts using social media, using the internet, pushing fake news. And there's a lot of evidence that they're doing that, that they're using propaganda efforts, not just against us, they do it against other countries too. Yep. They're not the only country that does it. Yeah, just check out Sputnik and RT, which is short for Russia Today. These right, are was, outlets yeah, in the United right, States right, and right. social media sites that push state propaganda from the Russian Federation. Um, Senator Cruz, we're moving toward questions from the audience, and you know the mechanism I informed you about that. We'll actually put that back up here again when we go to questions from the audience. Senator Cruz, you're running for re-election. I am. Right. Um, we had Beto O'Rourke here for an hour yesterday. Uh, <laughs> yes, he's dreamy, stop it, whatever. I mean, cut it, <laughs> cut it out. Um, he, your name came up. A lot. I yes, feel sir. like I feel like <laughs> respectfully, I should give you an opportunity to offer your perspective about him. My focus is on the direction of Texas, and I think Texans want a senator who fights to defend free market principles and the yeah. Constitution. I don't think Texans want a far left Democrat in the Senate. And are you characterizing him as a far left Democrat? I, you know, I'll let him speak to his own record. Sounds like you just spoke but, to but, him. But, but I can tell you this, look, look, yeah. look the, 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 this is a basic choice and, it, and I believe elections are about choices. Right. In the state of Texas, my priorities, and I think the priorities for Congress and the administration are fourfold. Number one, repealing Obamacare, giving people more choices, more options, lowering premiums so that health insurance is more affordable. Yes. Number two, fundamental tax reform, cutting taxes, simplifying the tax code. Ideally, what I want to see is a simple flat tax. Yep. Number three, 
major regulatory reform, lifting the burdens of federal regulations on farmers, on ranchers, on small businesses, okay. so that we see more jobs created. And number four, nominating and confirming strong principled constitutionalists to the U.S. Supreme Court and the federal courts. I believe those are also the priorities of Texans. Right. And, and that, the, that's your re-election campaign. Th right. that, that is what right. I'm fighting right. for. I think that, that, that is what the large majority of Texans want. Right. I think those are consistent right. with the values of right. most Texans. Now, the, to the two of you know, because we've done this before, that I am obsessed with your relationship. I've noticed that. I am. Uh, <laughs> You didn't endorse Cruz. Cruz didn't endorse you the last couple times. In fact, I think I got, I kind of busted your chops, Senator Cruz, because in the primary when Congressman Stockman, who had about as much chance of beating Senator Cornyn in the primary as I did, announced against him, you chose to stay out of that race and not endorse Senator Cornyn. I believe that you did not get involved in the race that Senator Cruz ran originally and endorsed him. You want That's to endorse right. Cruz right now? Well, let me tell you. I. <laughs> It's a, it's a free shot. It's a free shot. Here's, here's what I'll tell you, Evan. Yeah. After Hurricane Harvey, recognizing the importance of a unified Texas delegation. Well, you're not going to endorse invited, Beto, are you? Wait a minute. I invited Ted to breakfast. Yeah. And I said, Ted, you know, you and I have had our differences in the past. But truthfully, they've been mainly about tactics. That is how to accomplish the goal. Yep. We're both Texas conservatives. I mean, we basically share the same view philosophically and ideologically, but how to get things done, yes. we've differed. And I think it's important, I, this is what the conversation we had at, at breakfast, I think it's really important, particularly in light of the challenges brought by this huge natural disaster, that we stand together as a Texas delegation, and there's no space between Senator Cruz and me when it comes to doing the work of our state. And so I told him that I would support him in his reelection, and I think it's important to do so, to send a message that there, the Texans, when it comes to something like the recovery after this natural disaster, that we're gonna to stand together and not be distracted by these sorts of uh, Put party politics aside. That's, well, that's pretty well, declarative. That's and great. Put, yeah. just put tactical differences aside. Right. And I think Ted's been enormously constructive on everything from Harvey recovery to, uh, to the healthcare debate, and I appreciate it. That's great, and you're up in two years. 2023. Years. That's what I hear. Right. Are you planning to run again? I am. So you're announcing right now that you're going to run again in 2020? I am. I, you know, I'm, I'm the vote counter for the Senate now as the majority whip, and mm -hmm. I think it's frankly helpful, given my seniority and my position in leadership, yep. uh, to continue to serve as long as the people of Texas will have me, because I think it will result in tangible benefits to the state. I think we saw some of that on the initial uh, doubling of Harvey recovery. Yep. Uh, that didn't happen by accident. That happened because of our concerted effort to uh, make it happen. And so I think uh, as long as Texans will have me, I, uh, in, can, I intend to serve again. Got it. Well, we're going to open up now. Thank you, sir, for that. Thank we're going to open up the <laughs> curtain so that you're clear on the instructions for sending questions. A number of questions, though, have already come in and we'll go for as long as we have time. And then we will thank you for sending them. We'll take as many as we can. Uh, let me ask you about public town halls. Mm -hmm. That's a question that's on here, but quite honestly, it was a question on my list I didn't get to also. When I asked Senator Cruz, Congressman O'Rourke yesterday, what's your beef with, with Cruz? I asked him a couple different times to articulate substantive differences. Eventually, we got around to substance, but what he said initially was, you know, I, I've been going around the state to red communities, not blue communities, and I say, what did Senator Cruz tell you when he came here to do his town hall? And they said, he hasn't come. He was basically riding you for not interacting with constituents enough. And you both know that these days it's fashionable to, to ride politicians for not coming home enough, interacting with constituents, having town halls, making themselves more available to get constituent feedback. Do you do enough interaction with your constituents, Senator Cruz? That is a huge part of the job. Yeah. In 2017, I've done 17 town halls. 17. And I, look, you remember in, in 2012, you remember in 2012 when I was running for Senate the first time? Yes. Where the entire Republican establishment in this state was opposed to me. All of the money, all of the infrastructure. And the campaign that, that elected me was a grassroots campaign of thousands upon thousands of young people, of Republican women, of activists, 
It was a grassroots campaign. And, and those are the people to whom I'm accountable. And so let's take, for example, Harvey. The last three, four weeks, I have been spending every waking moment, if I'm not physically in D.C. because the Senate is in session, yes. traveling up and down the coast, going repeatedly two and three times to Victoria and Port Arthur and Rockport and, and Port Aransas and Beaumont and Orange and Nederland and Refurio and, and Meyerland and Kingwood and, and all of the different regions that have been pounded and, and meeting with county judges, meeting with mayors, meeting with school superintendents, meeting with firefighters, meeting not, with police Not all officers. Republicans. Many not. Yeah, right. Uh, many of them not. And right. to be honest, and particularly in a time of crisis, who yeah. cares? I mean, I mean, one of the great things in the city of Houston is we saw a Republican county judge and a Democratic mayor working hand in hand, and I was on the phone at times on a daily basis Correct. with both, saying, all right, what do you need? Let me, let me give you an example of that cooperation. The Saturday when the storm was coming into Houston, I talked to both Mayor Sylvester Turner and County Judge Ed Emmett. Both of them said, we got a real problem. We don't have enough assets for high water rescues. And, and we're concerned the volume of 911 calls is going to exceed our ability to do anything. Yes. So I hung up the phone and proceeded to light up the phone, reaching out to federal officials and state officials. I talked in the, over the course of several days multiple times to the president, talked to the vice president, talked to multiple cabinet members, talked repeatedly to the governor, said there is a problem in Houston. We need assets on the ground now. Within 24 hours, we saw helicopters coming in, we saw boats coming in, we saw high water trucks coming in, the governor sent DPS troopers in, mobilized eventually 14,000 National Guardsmen, the Coast Guard brought in choppers, brought in pilots from all across the country, and those resources, the results of the concern on the ground being heard up and down the chain, state and federal, meant that you had first responders and the assets there to save thousands of lives. Yep. The people that I'm responsive to, the people that I consider myself accountable to are the grassroots activists, the men and women of Texas. But you represent everybody. Absolutely, clear, right? yes. And, and I want to ask Senator Cornyn the same thing. You know, you, you're not just accountable in terms of the service you provide to your constituents or the availability that you provide, that you mm -hmm. make available to people, not just the people who voted for you, but Correct. to everybody, even the people who didn't vote for you. Correct. Do you feel like you're doing a good enough job of making yourself available? I do the best I can. Uh, yeah. You know, we, we represent 28 million people. Right. And we have responsibilities in Washington and here. And frankly, when I'm not in Washington, like Ted, I'm traveling around the state. I'll give you one example. After I was elected in 2002, I went down to the Rio Grande Valley. I said, you know, this is a really important part of our state, our bilateral trade with Mexico, our relationship uh, with that country from in terms of the five million jobs it, it creates in Texas. Um, I said, I realized I didn't carry the Rio Grande Valley. It's a pretty blue area part with, with some exceptions. And I said, but you know, my attitude is that the election's over and now my responsibility right. is to represent every single one right. of you. Right. And that's what I try to do. Got it. Um, Another, another audience question. If President Trump moves to arrange for the firing of special counsel Robert Mueller, what will your response be in the Senate and what should the Senate's response be? I think it would be a mistake. Yeah. I don't think it's likely to happen. Uh, I will say. A lot that's happened over the last 18 months was not likely to happen. <laughs> Starting with the election. Stipulated, right? Yeah. We are in uncharted waters. Yeah. Um, I will say the appointment of a special counsel is, is significant. You know, there was a reason a couple of decades ago that yes. both parties, Republican and Democrat, came together and agreed to allow the independent counsel statute to expire. Because the incentives for an independent counsel or a special counsel have proven in the past to be really strong incentives to engage in a fish, fishing expedition. Yes. That, that if you get an appointment, okay, you're in charge of this investigation, the mandate is you got to nail a hide to the wall. You, you have to have somebody that you go after, and, and, and that's a dangerous thing. I know Bob Mueller. I think yes. he is a man of integrity. I think he is a smart, capable prosecutor. My hope is that he focuses on the task he's been appointed to do, investigates it, 
and uncovers the actual facts. I think it will be a very different circumstance if the special counsel does what past independent counsels have done, which has become a wide-ranging fishing expedition that, that is abusing their power. I well, you know, now you know the, the, the president has actually expressed concern that the special counsel not exceed what he, the president, believes his authority should be in terms of going into things that are not related to, so, so, to this. So, so let me give you an, an example. I, I want to understand where, yeah. you put the, where right. do you put the parameters? So, so there was a book some years ago called Three Felonies a Day. Okay. And it argues that in our modern complex regulatory world that the average person commits three felonies a day. It's just the world is too complicated. It is true. If you unleashed a team of prosecutors, Evan, on your finances, your life, right. I guarantee you they I'd be doing a Tribune Festival from behind They bars, could right? find That's something. Right. I'm not even getting into that. But, yeah. but look, they could find something in your garden, in your backyard, and you pulled out the wrong weed, right. and suddenly, if you put enough people looking for it, they could find something to go after. That should not be the mandate of the special counsel is go back over all 70 years of Donald Trump's life, over every financial deal and find some real estate deal in New York City in 1972. If they go down those roads, you know, sure, I'm sure they could find some loan application that someone could argue didn't meet some regulatory standard. That's not what the special counsel, the special counsel yeah. was focused on Russian interference. That's what the special counsel needs to focus on. If he does that, that's doing its mandate. If it becomes a broader fishing right. expedition, that, right. that would be highly but, concerning. But, but of course, Senator Cornyn, it seems to me, I'm a lay person, I'm not a lawyer, but if the investigation is on Russian interference and it leaches over into cover-up or obstruction, that's fair game, right? Well, a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the noise surrounding the Russian involvement in our elections, including allegations of collusion, there's been nothing uh, to establish that. Our, so many of our Democratic colleagues have conceded that much. Yeah. But clearly, I think the special counsel has a very narrow uh, responsibility. I agree with Ted. This should not be an invitation to a fishing expedition. I think it would be helpful to the country for him to do his investigation thoroughly, but then also get it concluded um, in a reasonable time frame. Do you think he's conducting himself appropriately up to this point? I think so. You, you agree? We don't know. Right. Um, I, I, I look, you much of what know. he's done has not what, been public, what, so we, do, we don't know. Se I will what, say, well, Senator, what don't you know? Do you have suspicions? So I will say I'm troubled by the reports of how many of the lawyers he's hired are Democratic donors. Uh, and, and that was also an issue I raised in the Obama administration when the IRS targeted individuals and citizen groups based on their political views. I was very critical of the Obama IRS and the Obama Department of Justice because the person they put in charge of that uh, investigation was a major Democratic donor who'd given over $6,000 right. to President Obama and the Democrats. And particularly in a highly politically charged context, yes. I suspect the friends here in this audience would be less than comforted if the, if the investigation were being conducted by a major donor to Donald Trump. The same principle should hold that if someone has been a partisan Democratic donor and was out fighting for Hillary, maybe they shouldn't be someone using the investigation in, in, because right. there is a risk that it becomes right. political and partisan rather than impartial and based yeah. on the facts and law. Uh, we have time for just one more quick question from, again, our group, and it is directed to Senator uh, Cruz. You know, you came here last year, right? Uh, if you recall, I certainly recall, you may recall it was the day after you endorsed Donald Trump. We had a long conversation about your journey with Donald Trump during the primary. And uh, you said, I don't agree with everything Donald does, and we're going to see what happens. Are you prepared to endorse Donald Trump for re-election in 2020? And the question <laughs> here is, would you consider mounting a challenge under any circumstances to a sitting president if you were dissatisfied with the way that the office was being occupied? Well, you're right. When I was here last year, it was right after I had right. announced my support for Donald Trump. Right. Uh, I voted for Trump in the general election. Uh, now, I think it's fair to say Donald Trump was not my first choice for who should be president. Right. Um, Jeb Bush? <laughs> <laughs> but given the choice between yeah. Trump and Hillary Clinton, right, we know. I thought on the substance right. and merits that 
I agreed with the policies being put forth right. by Trump far more than the policies. That turned being out put to be forth. a good decision. You know, yes, and 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 I'll say this. You know, I have a, a sort of standing rule in 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 Washington, which is as reporters come down down the halls of the Capitol and ask questions, that I don't comment on tweets. Yep. I don't comment on the random comment of the day. You had a whole list of here's what the president tweeted today. I don't comment on any of those. He can speak for himself. I will comment on policy and substance and issues. And I actually think on policy and substance, there have been a lot of good decisions. I think the cabinet appointments, by and large, have been very strong. Yep. Uh, I think the regulatory actions, lifting many of the oppressive regulations. When I talk to small businesses, I was out yesterday in West Texas, was talking to, to farmers, speaking at a, a big gathering of farmers in West Texas. I asked, are things different? They said, yes, it's much easier to deal with the federal regulatory agencies now than it was a year ago. It's a world of difference. Yep. I think that's positive. I think Neil Gorsuch to the Supreme Court was a home run. And so what I have been trying to do is encourage President Trump and the administration to go in a positive direction and discourage them from going in a negative direction. And you'll keep doing that. And I will keep doing that. Good. And, and I really do think we've got an historic opportunity. It is rare that the voters elect a Republican president, you have Republican heads of every agency, and Republican majorities in both houses. And my view is we got to deliver. Well, you own it. Right? And, and, and if it. we don't, yeah. I mean, I mentioned the four priorities, Obamacare, yeah. tax yeah. reform, reg reform, and judges. If we can deliver on the, those four, this could be the most productive Congress in decades. And if we don't, if we screw them all up and produce nothing, this will be one of the most heartbreaking right. missed opportunities we've ever seen. And, and so what I'm spending my time doing is trying to bring Republicans together. And I, I do think I'm in a fairly, and look, no, 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 I, I recognize no, no, no. actually. I, we're, we're coming to the end, so let me just ask you to make your, make your point. Yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. I, I, I recognize actually this, the, the media caricature of bomb thrower is inconsistent with conciliator. But I actually believe this stuff. It's yep. very simple. You know, you talk about town halls. I engage with protesters all the time. I'm happy to have conversations. I ran for the Senate because I believe the American free enterprise system is the greatest engine of freedom and opportunity the world has ever seen. That I want people like my dad to be able to come to America and achieve a better world. I believe in the Constitution and Bill of Rights and free speech and the Second Amendment and religious liberty. And, and, and I care about them. Right. If we mess this up, we may never get the chance again. And, and I do right. think I'm in a relatively unusual position of being able to speak with real credibility to conservatives, to moderates, to leadership, to the president, to the administration, right. trying to get them on the, on the same page. And I will say, I think John Cornyn and I together are right. a very effective team for the state of Texas. I'm very appreciative of his support for my reelection bid. And I think the two of us together, we play different roles. But I think the state of Texas is benefited by having the two of us side by side fighting for 28 million texts. Well, I appreciate you saying that. And to your point, if I mess up getting cornered out of here on time, we may never be in this position again. So um, I want to thank you both for making the time to Thanks, be here. Senator. Good of you to come. We always like having you back. Senator Cornyn, Senator Cruz, give them a big hand. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. That was fun. Thanks, Senator. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, Evan, give me a hug. Okay. <laughs>